Good evening, everyone. Species extinction. Right? Depressing, right? Uh, you know, you came here tonight, you want to be enlightened, inspired, maybe entertained, and here comes Condell, he's going to talk about species extinction, right? A real downer. Well, I'm hoping the first half of this might be a downer, so just fair warning. But I'm hoping by the second half, I'll leave you with something that's somewhat empowering and something which I think is unique to human beings as a species. I want to start out with this little guy. Okay. This is the Bramble K. Melamese. Right. Just by a show of hands, how many people have ever heard of the Bramble K. Melamese? Anybody? I see one hand out there, maybe two. It's probably what I expected coming in. Most of you have never heard of this species before. And bad news, you're never going to meet a member of this species again, because it was declared extinct in June of 2016. Now, there's two reasons why I wanted to start with this little guy. The first is that I suspected probably most of you had never heard of him before. Okay? I'll come back to that a little bit later. The second reason I wanted to talk about him, or at least begin my discussion talking about him, is because this is the first mammalian species, at least as far as we know, that's gone extinct primarily because of climate change. Okay? Will it be the last? Probably not. Right? In fact, there's probably some that have already gone extinct that we haven't quite identified yet. But basically what happened is this was a very low-lying species, and its habitat was more or less flooded by rising sea levels uh, by the Great Barrier Reef. Okay? Now, species extinction is occurring at an incredibly fast rate. This is just a sampling of some of the species that have gone extinct just since the year 2000. Um, these are the more sort of charismatic species that have died off. This is an image of, of Lonesome George, who was the last Pinta Island tortoise. At least we thought he was. There may be hope now. We, we might have found some other ones. So occasionally we have some good news to, to spread. But species are, are dying out at an incredibly fast rate. So fast, in fact, that it's basically matching some of the major extinction events in the history of the Earth. And there's been five of those. Okay? The, the, the most famous of those events was the last one that happened at the end of the Cretaceous period. Right? This is when this giant asteroid hit in the Yucatan Peninsula and basically ended the age of the dinosaurs. So this is the one that we're most familiar with. Uh, that was the fifth mass extinction. It's pretty clear now to most scientists that we are right now in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. Uh, in 2014, Elizabeth Colbert uh, from The New Yorker wrote a book called The Sixth Extinction. Uh, it's an incredible book. Again, not exactly a cheery one, but an incredible book in the sense that each chapter is devoted to a particular species that's either gone extinct or is on the verge of extinction, and drawing upon the scientists who are really close to the ground with these various species. Okay. And basically, the consensus is that species have always gone extinct throughout the Earth's history. But if you compare the background extinction rate to the rate of extinction today, it's almost undeniable that we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. Why is that? Well, it's a combination of factors. It's global warming. It's the acidification of oceans. It's deforestation. It's invasive species. It's overhunting, it's poaching, it's a lot of things, but all of those things, by the way, come back to us. Right? We are causing the sixth mass extinction in the Earth's history. Again, not exactly great news. If we look at where things are going moving forward, uh, this is an image from the New York Times from a couple of years ago. Roughly a quarter of all mammals are endangered at this point. Uh, you see amphibians are actually doing much worse. 41% uh, of amphibians are, are thought to be endangered at this point. Uh, one of the, the chapters in Colbert's book is, is, is devoted uh, to amphibians in the Amazon rainforest, which are, are dying off in huge numbers uh, because of a fungicide that, that's actually killing them off at, at a quite rapid rate. Okay. So what do we do with this? Right? The big question that I want to talk about today is, well, why should we care? Okay. Um, I'm not going to address all of these questions today, but one of the things that a lot of people say in the face of species extinction is, well, aren't there bigger problems? Aren't there more pressing problems? What about human beings who are suffering? Right? Uh, how do we basically align, or how do we make sense of where our priorities lie? Right? Um, others might say, hey, survival of the fittest. Right? We're the fittest. We won. Uh, so if other species are dying off, they just weren't strong enough. Right? Can we spin it that way and maybe not feel, feel quite as badly about ourselves? And really, the Bramble K. Melamese, nobody heard of this five minutes ago. So you're asking me to care about something that I never heard of before. Why should I care? Okay. I think the easiest argument to make is to say, 
this comes back to bite us in the end, and it's already doing so. Uh, whether we're talking about interruptions to the food chain, ecotourism, right, how ecosystems are being thrown off by removing one species and, and maybe oftentimes introducing a foreign invasive one. Human beings are suffering directly because of this. Uh, and I think that's the easier argument to make. Philosophers refer this to the sort of anthropocentric argument. But I think there's a, a higher level argument that we can make here that appeals to something that's unique about us as human beings. Franz de Waal is a primatologist, works out of Emory University, and he spent most of his life studying other primates, chimpanzees, bonobos. In the last 20 years or so, he's been making the argument that our closest genetic uh, relatives are much more social, dare we say even moral, than we've traditionally given them credit for. Okay. Um, philosophers throughout history, at least in the Western tradition, have spoken of ethics as overcoming our animal nature. And DeWall thinks that that's completely unfair because animals, especially those closely related to us, are quite social. And they oftentimes exhibit behaviors that are pretty identifiable to us. Consolation behaviors, altruism, even sometimes a, a sense of justice. And what he wants to say is that there's a moral continuity here and that we shouldn't be surprised by that because we're 98% similar, right? So to think that all of a sudden human beings showed up and we're uniquely moral, he thinks that gets it wrong, okay? Now, even if we acknowledge that moral continuity, Philip Kitcher, a philosopher at Columbia University, says there must be something that's different about human beings, right? That we could acknowledge this continuity but there seems to be some kind of break, some kind of difference. And what he suggests is drawing what he calls altruism profiles, which basically say, well, how far are we willing to go to help out people who are unlike us, who are strangers, right? Who we have no immediate sort of uh, a relationship with, at least familiarly, right? Um, and he suspects that, well, we might see these sort of proto-moral behaviors in other primates, but it seems like human beings are capable and have oftentimes gone further in helping out those who are quite unlike themselves. Okay. I think Kitcher's probably right about this. Um, you know, if you've ever watched your nature specials on, you know, your planet Earth or your Nova specials, you know, chimpanzees can be terrifying, especially to members outside of their group. And human beings, at least when we're at our best, seem to be capable of doing much more than that. But of course, we also know that at our worst, we're just as bad. So if we really want to say, why should we care about the distinction of these species, perhaps we need to call upon sort of a higher moral capacity that human beings may in fact be uniquely capable of, even if we don't quite exercise as, as much as we should. This brings me back to my initial point about the Bramble K. Melanies. Aldo Leopold, some of you may be familiar with, is usually thought of as being the father of American conservation. His Sand County Almanac, published way back in 1949, is still widely read and used in, in, in by conservationists, by philosophers, by people who just love nature and the environment. And he spends a long section of this book talking about the passenger pigeon. And the passenger pigeon is a species that more or less we hunted uh, to extinction. And he reflects on this monument that's erected to the passenger pigeon in great sadness at the loss of this species. And what always kind of strikes me when I read this with my students is they, you know, they never really heard, or maybe they've heard of the passenger pigeon, but they didn't know it had gone extinct, and they certainly didn't know what it looked like. Um, and this is kind of news to them, even though it's from 100 years ago. Right? And this is where I see the similarity with the Bramble K. Melanies, is that maybe the first point is just to kind of notice what's happening and to realize that something's being lost here that, again, if we're true to who we are as human beings, maybe it should bother us, maybe it should impact us. And I want to include this really powerful passage from Leopold, right? That in reflecting on the loss of the passenger pigeon, again, which a lot of my students had never heard of before they started reading about this, he says that for one species to mourn the death of another is a new thing under the sun. Had the funeral been ours, the pigeon would hardly have mourned us. In this fact lies objective evidence of our superiority over the beast. I think what Leopold's talking about here, long before Kitcher, is this notion that if we're really going to live up to our highest calling as moral beings, it's going to lie in our ability to care for others that are very much different from us. And I think that the history of human morality has been this struggle to try to expand the moral universe to include others who are different from us. And we're continuing to fail in that regard, 
But what Leopold wants to say is that not only should we include the people, people who are different from us, look different, speak differently, act differently from us, maybe the final challenge is going to be to care about species who really don't give a damn about us. Right? Because it's not in their natures to care about us, but that's what makes us different. That we have this unique ability to care about individuals and to care about species who ultimately maybe we're causing the extinction of, but maybe we could ultimately save. And I'm hoping that in reading Leopold and taking him seriously, that though this is a depressing subject, hopefully we can empower to do better as we move forward. Thank you.